So now let's look at the implications between the two sides. You're going to go through life. <clears throat> Same thing applies to me, okay? You're going to go through life shifting between good deeds and God deeds. Because, you know, we're not going to be all using 1 John 1 9, you know, 100% of the time. That's the difference between good deeds and God deeds. Anything you do between sins. If you use 1 John 1 9 and you haven't sinned again yet, anything you do between sins is a God deed. Anything. The Holy Spirit is working on you between sins. That's what 1 John is saying. That's its whole point. And during a state of sin, you, like most of the world, have this operating system, we all have it, called the sin nature, and it's hung up on good deeds in order to garner a favorable self-opinion or to get favorable opinion from other people. The good deeds mindset is the sin nature mindset. Sin and good deeds are coming from the same source. They have the same problems. They are addictive. And they all assign a godlike quality to self-approval or people approval. Because that's exactly the structure of the temptation that Satan gave the woman in Genesis 3. If you do this <clears throat> then you will be as smart as God now she has to accept his opinion of that in order to eat the fruit and she has to believe that what she does can do something in order to eat the fruit you see that the whole pitch of good deeds is based on the idea that number one, you can do something good. Two, that it will make you good. Three, that you'll get approval from yourself and people. <clears throat> Especially people. It's the same exact nature as Genesis 3 temptation. It's just that one kind of sin is what society calls sin and another kind of sin society calls good deeds. Now, they get that the sin thing gloms onto actions that could be could actually good but might not be I mean let's just take a real simple example it's a good deed if you eat the right food because that benefits your body that's very true. And in fact, there are a whole lot of self-righteous people out there who are very willing to bend your ear for hours about how good they are about their all-natural foods and they want to sell you on eating the way they do. And, oh, you know, you shouldn't take those... You know, you shouldn't listen to doctors giving you pills. You should take our natural solution. What do they think chemicals come from? Anything you put in your mouth has chemicals in it. <clears throat> it's just a question of whether the chemicals are artificially created from other chemicals which are ultimately natural. Or whether the chemicals are natural to begin with. Iron, okay, is a mineral. 
and in the you know, sort of loose sense of the term, is a chemical. Yeah, you eat too much of it, you're going to die. Hello. So there are some people very self-righteous about the food they eat. But that doesn't detract from the fact that food in a certain composition, in a certain amount, is going to benefit your health. And food in certain other amounts is not going to benefit your health. But the people who are self-righteous about what they're eating and brag about it, and, oh, I, I fasted for 40 days, and, oh, I lost weight, uh-huh. Why are you telling us? Why do we need to know that? You're trying to evangelize us on what you did, and actually, secretly, you're kind of proud about the fact that you went on this diet, and you just want to, you know, brag about it. No, oh, so much for the good deed. If a deed is really good, you don't need to brag about it. You just enjoy the results. Somebody trades food tips with you, you know, and it's like, oh, let's see, look, this thing is really tasty and it's only got 30, 300 calories. So it's, you know, try it. That's one thing. Because you're just trading tips about, you know, you're both interested in that kind of food. and That's one thing. But if you're going to sit there and brag about how you ate or what you ate or what you didn't eat and, oh, I've now lost all this weight, mm -hmm. why are you telling us? So there you go right there about it's not such a good deed, even when it is a good deed. <clears throat> Food of itself is neither good nor bad. What did the Lord say? It's what comes out of your mouth, not what goes into your mouth that makes you good or bad. So, doing good deeds, the mindset of good deeds, is like, okay. Every single thing on this planet can be used well or badly. And not a thing on this planet does a thing for God. Okay, so good deeds share the same mindset as sin, and in fact give rise to sin. The, th the deed that's done isn't necessarily good because it depends on competence and a whole bunch of other things. And the thing that you're doing actually, of itself, has to be very carefully done, like how you eat, in order to even be good. And if it is good, there's a final point problem about it, then why do you need to brag about it? If you need to brag about it or need to tell yourself like the woman did, you will be good if you do this. If that's what you need to do to make yourself, how you want to call it, motivate yourself to do the good deed, then you might as well not do it because you're basically negating the value of the deed. You're adding a condition to the deed to make it good, that it makes you good, that you're a better person because you do it. If that's how you feel about doing that good deed, then you're actually stabbing yourself with a lie. If I do a good deed, I am not a better person for doing it. I am benefited if I do it. If it's a good deed, then it benefits the one who does it. If it's a good deed, then it benefits the one who gets it. That's why it would be called a good deed. The deed itself has nothing to do with who does it. It has everything to do with the intrinsic quality of the deed itself. So if I eat properly, and I happen to really enjoy food that's good for you, it just tastes better to me. Well, then I benefited from it. There's nothing to brag about. I got something for what I did. I'm like peanut butter, too. You can argue that one both ways. Because like anything that you do in life, you can do too much of it, and it's no longer good anymore. 
But I'm not going to sit here and brag to you about how much I love celery and yogurt, seasoned yogurt. I love it. That's not a good deed. It's good for me. I benefit from it. And I enjoy it tremendously. Does that make me a good person and I'm better than you because you eat lots of potato chips and and, uh, McDonald's hamburgers? No. I'm not better than you. More power to you. I hope you enjoyed the McDonald's. See? Good deeds is poison. Total, utter poison. It's, it's, it's sin that calls itself good. That's what it is. That's why it's called the knowledge of good and evil. Eating from that tree. The knowledge of good and evil. they are two sides of a coin. And what's evil about good deeds is that they're really sin that calls themselves good. Woe to you who calls evil good and good evil. So the implication, sorry it took me to get so long to get here. The implication in this whole debate about God deeds versus good deeds is completely scary. Because we're all going to do, assuming we believe in Christ and actually use 1 John 9, we're all going to do X number of good deeds. They're all going to get burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians 3. How embarrassing. What a waste of time. It becomes absolutely imperative to ask God, please God, remind me to use one John one night. That's the first, you know, RX for this situation. Please God, remind me to use one John one nine. Because I don't want to live I don't want to do good deeds. Good, You'd be better off being in hell than doing good deeds. And 99% of Christianity will never, ever catch on. They're going to die. We're all going to die. And what are we going to have as a result? A lifetime of good deeds. Do you know how many Christians will be proud of themselves for that? They won't be so proud when they're standing in front of Christ and they're watching all the real character of their good deeds, the stinkiness of them, burn up. In other words, the good deeds are going to be represented by wood, hay, and stubble. Each one kind of with a tag or something. I don't know how he's going to do it. But you're going to have a great big bonfire. And so will I, because I'm sure I've done a lot of good deeds in my life. They're enjoyable to do, for crying out loud. Sin's got its own enjoyment, and good deeds have their own enjoyment. So we're addicted to both. And we will justify both to ourselves. I don't even want to think about how big my bonfire's going to be. But, you know, I know about 1 John 1 9. I'm petrified. Please, God, just do it to me, okay? That's the first scary thing. And the Rx for that first scary thing is, please God remind me to use 1 John 1 9. So I don't spend much time in, you know, what what my pastor likes to call Satan's cosmic system. I think that's a term he sort of borrowed from Lewis Sperry Schaefer. Schaefer. C-H-A-F-E-R. The guy who wrote all that, that sort of theological volume. It's found at Schaefer Seminary. Um, that's the first scary thing. And the RX is just, please, God, please, remind me to use 1 John 1 9. Now, I asked him that a long time ago when I finally, I mean, my mother taught me about 1 John 1 9. Before, I mean, she never even heard of my pastor. And then she went off and, you know, stopped being a Christian. Like, you know, everybody else. You all, most Christians are going to stop being Christians before they're dead. They're going to stop believing. This is the, That's the whole thrust of the spiritual life. I'm going to be posting another series to explain that. But <clears throat> the point is, is that I had learned it early. For, in home. At the home. 
And then, you know, my parents just both, they, they thought Christianity was for the birds and they got out of it. And by then I was already an adult. And that was when I found out about my pastor during college. Well, he was real big on 1 John 1 9. And I realized when I, you know, it didn't take me much to get into the idea, hey, you know, if I'm not using 1 John 1 9, I'm not spiritual. It's real obvious. The scripture couldn't be plainer. Psalm 32 5 and Psalm 66 18 in the Old Testament. 1 John 1 9 and 1 Corinthians 11 in the New and um, 2 Peter. 1 Peter 1 9, 2 Peter 1 9, something like that. It's all over the place. The point is, is that you're not spiritual if God's not doing it to you. And you can't be spiritual in a state of sin. You can't pray, nothing works, you don't understand Bible, you just might as well crawl up and die. Okay, I knew that. So I said to God, please remind me to use a verse when I'm screwed up. Yeah, and he's, he does. Sometimes even in my sleep. When I'm having a dream I shouldn't have, you know. And I'm giving in to the temptation in the dream. So, you can do that too. Sorry to harp on it so much, but this is the spiritual life. It's the light switch. It's the difference between being embarrassed at the judgment seat of Christ and having something to show for it. Gold, silver, precious stones can only be made by God. Man cannot make those things. He can fake them. But he can't make the real article. Only God can. That means the Holy Spirit has to do it to you. The Holy Spirit did it to Christ. We all know that. He was filled with the Spirit though his whole life. That's John 7.39. We know that. So why aren't we taking the lesson from it? You're not filled with the Spirit if you're not using 1 John 1 9 every time you sin. Do you have to remember every sin exactly? No. Look at how David did it in Psalm 32 5 and in, in Psalm 66 18. I sinned. Very many times you'll see it sprinkled throughout the Testament, the, the Old Testament. Solomon said to David, I sinned, not Solomon, but Saul. Saul said to David, I sinned against you. He didn't name which one it was. It's a general admission. I did this. Okay? I do that a bazillion times a day. Did it just now, just in case. Name your sin to God. If you don't know what it is, just say, I know I sinned that somehow. And if, you know, he'll make you aware of what kind it was if you need it for training. The idea of naming it is so you get better training, better recognition. Okay? It's like when you do something right, you want to know how you got it right. You want to go through the steps. When you get it wrong, you don't want to know how you got it wrong. So naming the specific sin is good training. That's what that's what's for. But if you don't know, name it. Just say, general, I, I did it. Okay? That's the scary first Rx. Just, I sinned, Dad. So now you're spending less time in the so-called cosmic system, in a state of sin, hallucinating that you're holy. Second Rx, and this is really the most important, you're the fruit, not what you do. The good deed that God's doing, that God wants, is to make you Christ-like. What you do does not make you Christ-like. What you think makes you Christ-like. Christ in you, thank you, Dad. Christ in you, the confidence of glory. Colossians 1, 25 through 27. Christ in you. Not what you do. What he does in you. Romans 8. What he does in you. Ephesians 3, 15 through 19. What he does in you. 1 John 4, 12 through 16. What he does in you. What you become. Fruit is a kid. Fruit of the womb is a kid. 
the woman is made pregnant. She doesn't do any work. She's stuck with it. What we call labor is really something happening to her. And it's horrible. But that that's not, the woman isn't doing the work. The woman is living, how do you want to call it? Is, is surviving, stuck with, imprisoned by something happening to her. The tree is not really producing its own fruit. The fruit happens to the tree. And no sapling or seedling produces fruit. You have to be mature before you can bear fruit. And you're not doing anything to bear the fruit. It happens to you. Bearing fruit is like being pregnant. It happens to you. And you're receiving it and living with it and trying to survive it. When you get into an accident, it happens to you. I sprained my arm. Yeah, that was what I did. I fell. I wasn't looking where I was going. I did that all by myself. What do you know? Yeah, but the sprain happened to me. I didn't deliberately try to sprain my arm. I was an idiot. And the sprain happened to me. So now this information is happening to me. Why well, keep taking my little rest? Because I can't type for very long. So God's doing something with the sprain. See? He's making good on something I did which was bad and something that happened to me which also was bad and it's bearing fruit but I'm not bearing the fruit it's happening to me and if you get something out of it it's happening to you I'm not the one doing it he's doing it you must want something or he's making it clear to you in some way I don't know I can't see into your soul, and even if I could, I wouldn't know how to speak properly to it. I don't even know what, what's happening to my own soul, much less yours. See? This whole thing for at, at our end, what we do is do-do. And God makes it work. And what, is, what kind of work is He doing? That's the most important thing to say here. The second scary thing is the work God wants the deed God does the thing he accomplishes and we don't do that's a pity of it is he changes the way we think it's two operating systems you got the shit on a shingle operating system and that's exactly the right word that Paul uses in Philippians 3.8. He calls all of his good deeds shit. That's the exact word he uses in Greek. Modern Greek word is scat. Ancient Greek word was skubala. In that verse, it literally means turds. The sin nature system. The sin nature operating system. SNAS. Sauce, SOS, shit on a shingle. That's an old World War II term for a meal that they used to get called, you know, the cream chip beef. And it tasted so bad they called it shit on a shingle. It was cream chip beef on toast. That's your mindset. That's my mindset. That's our natural mindset. The good deeds mindset is shit on a single operating system. Versus God's operating system. And the two are completely incompatible. That's the theme of Romans 8. And the shit on a shingle operating system is like Windows 8. With UEFI enabled. Windows 8 with UEFI enabled won't allow any other operating system. 
it's going to have a monopoly of your computer. Unless you have a, a signature. You can't have another operating system on this computer. That's the sin nature for you. It monopolizes everything. What you call good, what you call bad, it's all the same operating system. It's going to fool you and say that one type of operation is sin. But this other operation, good deeds, oh, that's holy. Uh-huh. Then why do they both share the same addiction characteristic? You'll notice that God deeds are not addictive. You're between sins. You've used 1 John 1 9. There's nothing stopping you from sinning. As soon as you as soon as the temptation hits you and you say yes to it, the Holy Spirit backs off and you boot out of God's operating system and into the shit on a shingle operating system, Satan's operating system, SOS. Yeah, and you think it's going to help you too. There's no tyranny there. Tyranny is SOS, but God's operating system didn't stop you. So how scary is this? 1 John 1 9 is the only way to boot into God's operating system. And then... The work that he really does is to change you because you're the one going to heaven. The world and all its works are going to be burnt up. Second Peter, second half. Christ in you, the confidence of glory. Not Christ in your good deeds, the confidence of glory. And if you're learning God's operating system, and you're operating on God's operating system, which is what? Being under your right pastor, learning and living on Bible. You're doing that? What did God say he'll do for the world? Leviticus 26. If the people who are called by my name will follow my what? Word. How can you follow a word you don't learn? And how can you follow a word you learned on your own? Do you know how to interpret the scripture? Can you take the, the 16 bazillion verses in scripture, integrate them all completely, and say how they fit together to apply to the email you're writing or going to the opera or going to the bathroom? No. It's too complicated. God's operating system can only be operated by God. Only God knows how all those verses fit together. And he gives a teacher to teach you it. But you're not learning the whole thing at once. So you're never competently applying it. You can't. You don't know enough to competently apply it. Your teacher doesn't know enough to competently apply it. It takes a lifetime to even learn it. Well, but how, how can you live with it now then? Good question. So God can do that. It better be God because nobody else can do it. I can't even remember the verses, much less understand them. And how they fit to, you know. I gotta go buy a can of tomatoes, Dad. What should I do? What brand of tomatoes should I buy? And how does this have anything to do with the spiritual life? Well, he's gonna make it have something to do with it. You see, it's an entirely different operating system. Entirely different definition of everything. What I do is training me in thinking. It's bass backwards what, you know, versus the world. 
The purpose of doing stuff in this body in God's system is to train the brain. Not out from the brain and then you do something and it has value. Uh Uh-uh. It's the other way around. Because everything I do with my body will die. That's the last half of Romans 8 and the last half of 2 Peter. And what did Peter say? 2 Peter 3.11 just flew into my mind. What sort of persons must we become in a dedicated to God lifestyle? Now you won't find it translated that way. They usually translate it godliness, which is stupid. Its Greek word is eusebia. It's kind of where Eusebius, the name Eusebius, comes from. It means a lifestyle that's dedicated to God. Uh, Boltman, I think, was the guy who finally came up with that better sense of the word. But in English, they didn't know how to translate it well, so they just called it godliness. What sort of persons must we become in a dedicated to God lifestyle? Faced with the fact, because that was what preceded in Peter, before Second Peter 3.11, faced with the fact that the world and all its works are going to get burnt up. What do you do? That's the second scary Rx. What do you do? You use 1 John 9 was first. Second, you learn and live on Bible, baby, because the whole game is the opposite of what the world says. Everything you do in life is designed by God to be a training device for you, for other people. He organizes and runs the whole show. You have no idea. I, I Look, I've, I've been a believer now since what? My mother said since I was four or five or six. As far as I know, I was a believer since I was 18. Okay, I'm 59 now. That's a long time to be a believer. To this day, when I go to wash dishes, I have no idea what God is doing to me. I mean, sometimes I get a glimmer. Sometimes I realize that the washing of the dish, there's going to be some person assuming I, you know, actually finish the course. If I finish the course, just like any other believer, I would become a king. There's a kingdom that would be inherited in my name. That's the, the same, you know, will of God for you too. Each one of us, that's the will of God. That we become kings and then we inherit a kingdom. Okay? If we all actually lived up to that, then there would be no kingdom. We'd just be rich as kings and enjoy that. But because we'll all for- most of us will forfeit, then the people who forfeit have to go- be assigned to those who are left. Okay? So if I finish the course and I, I actually you know finish maturing in Christ, Ephesians 4.13, then I will inherit a kingdom. Okay, somebody in my kingdom will be the equivalent of a dish. Because they refuse to learn Christ. But God will give them some use. And so someone will be the equivalent of a dish. But with volition. They will be happy to be the equivalent of a dish. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. But they'll be happy because they should be in hell, but won't be. So when I do the dishes, I think of that. And it just, it breaks my heart. You are the work, not what you do. And if you don't learn that, then all your works are doo-doo. And you end up being a dish? Some low life menial person in heaven very glad to be there very health hell, happy no more sorrow no more tears no more pain no more death you'll be happy to be a dish because the justice of it will just be beautiful to you okay but you don't have to have that future this is devastating Everybody around me, everybody I know, is running after works. 
They don't realize that Christ trained for 30 years to become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Romans 5 He got that way by means of the knowledge. By means of knowledge he makes righteous. Isaiah 53.11 If that's true for Christ, that's true for us. And everything you do down here is just a spoon, a training device to train you in thinking. It's like practicing piano. You know, a, a really good pianist, we hear the output of the pianist. But the actual skill is in his thinking, coordinating with his fingers. The part you can't hear is his thinking, his focus, his concentration, his integration of his thought and his fingers in one great big symphony. There's a symphony you can't hear going on in his soul when he plays. And you get part of it, you know, because of the fluency of the way he plays. And you can see his emotion and feel his emotion as he's touching the keys. And that's why people get so, you know, moved by a good pianist. But the actual skill of it is in his soul, the part you can't see. So the beauty of what he does on the outside is nothing compared to the beauty of what's going on on the inside. And he does it over and over and over and over for hours a day, months, depending on how difficult the piece is, in order to have that one virtuoso performance. Okay, but God's doing it in you so that you will be like that for all time. And so he's using going to the bathroom, the dishes, writing an email. All these things he's using to train your brain in his son's thinking. It's the opposite. It's from the action of the body to the brain to coordinate and then circling back to the body to coordinate. Because you're getting a new body in heaven. And your body down here, because it's so much worse and dumber, means that there has to be more coordination. I hope you get that, like in military training. The devices that you use to train with, in military training of any kind, hiking training of any kind, whatever you use to train with has to be harder than what you're actually going to use in, in the real effort. In other words, in, in like military training, you train with a 100-pound pack, even if you're only going to wear 30. Actually, they usually wear 100-pound packs. You train with something heavier and harder so that it'll be easier to use the weapon you're eventually going to have. So the body is harder to deal with. This body is really dead. So you have to do it over and over and over. It's like a, a battery that never holds a charge. You have to wash every day. You have to pee several times a day. You can't just pee once and then, you know, you don't have to pee again for a year. You have to eat X number of times a day. You constantly have to breathe. This body is extremely weak. It constantly needs attention so how come we're expecting that good comes out of this body it's all the way around it's a handicap so he uses the handicap of your body to train your much more capable soul so that in eternity your much more capable body will be easy, easily integrated, and much more enjoyable to use. That's what the good deed is that God is doing. And because 
you're willing to learn and this reverse process is occurring where the deed is training your brain because you're the fruit not what you do he will bless the world Leviticus 26 because you're living on his word you're obeying his word how do you obey a word you hear it you believe it then you try to implement it and your practice is always glitching and wrong so you do it again and again and again and hey it's not addictive is it it's not like good deeds in the world when you use God's word there's this strong urge all the time to give up you see everything about God deeds is the opposite of good deeds God deeds are designed to train you and then God blesses the world because you're willing to be trained are you doing anything good no you're helpless you can't even run God's operating system you only know how to boot in it that's like a user of a Windows PC all he knows how to do is press the power button and they've even removed that now that's all you know how to do one John one nine that presses the power button you don't know what apps are in God's system you don't know what apps are on the computer of your soul only God knows what the apps are only God knows how to run the apps where do you find them you know how to boot into the system and everything else you gotta ask God about okay God I'm, I went to Bible class today and I sat there and I I kept on willing to listen what did I learn do you know I always have to ask him I'm asking him 24 7 what am I doing dad what am I learning that's God's system and then he tells you the good deed system oh you do all the telling you see something wrong with this picture peace out